<laughs> all right, this week we're doing something really special. Matt and I have come all the way to the countryside in England in order to build a custom guitar with Crimson Guitar. This has been the owner. What's up? So, let's get into it. Before jumping into the build, let me do a little bit better of a job at explaining quick. See, Triton Tool surprised Matt Carmona and I with a trip to the UK to go build a custom electric guitar in the brand new school of Crimson Guitars. Ben runs his own channel covering everything to do with guitar making, but also has a school which just expanded to holding 13 students at a time. It is fascinating just how much work goes into making a guitar, and I'm going to be covering the process in my next few videos. So let's go ahead and jump into it. I started off by picking out the wood for all of my components of the guitar. I have roasted sycamore for the neck, ebony for the fretboard, then a cracked piece of alder for the body. Now I knew I wanted a body with a crack so that I can incorporate some bow ties. Setting the body aside, I started with the neck. Now I don't know a thing about guitar making, so while I did the work, I had a luthier named Chris working alongside me through the build. This is my amazing luthier, Chris. So whenever I reference Chris, this is who I'm talking about. After temporarily attaching the neck template to my sycamore, I walked it back to the wood shop at the back of the classroom to cut it out or at least do a rough cut out where I remove the bulk of the material. I don't know how many times I played neck only guitar, but Matt and I kept ourselves pretty entertained pretending we knew what we were doing. He was working on the start of his body while I was working on my neck. After finishing off the final shape to the template with a flush trim bit in the work center, I pulled the template off and cut down the neck to roughly the thickness needed. After resawing it at the bandsaw, I threw it through the planer for a few passes to get it to the final thickness. Oh, and you see Ben there working. He was actually inspired watching Matt and I and started his own guitar. You can see that build over on his channel. I left the links to everything down below. Getting back to the workbench, I made a few marks to find center on the neck because next was attaching a jig to cut in a slot to fit in the truss rod. Good? Perfect. Okay. What's that? This is a truss rod. Uh, this is the mechanism in the neck that actually allows us to adjust it. Ah. The jig not only dictates the width of the truss rod cavity for the router, but we set a screw to act as a stop for the exact length of my particular rod. This way, when we were over at the router, I can start off with the bit high, use the plunge feature to sink into the wood, push the router forward, and it stop up against the screw. The router leaves a rounded slot, so some slight cleanup work is needed with a chisel to square things off until that truss rod can slip right in. Next was to temporarily attach the fretboard to a fretboard making template of Crimson's. And this attaching method is one of the most handy tricks I've picked up this year. You place masking tape on your workpiece and also whatever you want to stick it to. Burnish it by using anything around, then run a thin line of CA glue down the center of the tape. Apply pressure for a few seconds and you're ready to rock. All right, so we've got those notches on the template. Yes. I've got that little pin right there. Ooh, lovely. That just locks in. Perfect system. So Crimson's template has the spacing for the frets already lined out with a notch. Then they have a pin placed on the deck of the saw for this notch so you can just move your fretboard along notch by notch until the frets are cut in. Boy. It's crazy how heavy this wood is. It's dense. It's a very dense wood, but the wear resistance. Uh, oh, well, uh, beep, beep, beep. Yeah. That's not what it sounds like, but. <laughs> no, that's not even close. Okay, make me stop. <laughs> What's next? Up next, cutting in a slot that will later hold a small piece of bone. I did this by using a handsaw to cut in the boundary of the bone's position, then a tiny little chisel to hollow it out. If you're interested in guitar making, note that Crimson makes and sells a ton of specialized tools to make this job easier. Now it's time to attach the fretboard to the neck. I first drew a few center lines on both pieces so that when I set the two on top of one another, I could use these lines to center the two to each other. And while I'm just giving you an overview of these steps, it's worth noting that a lot of these steps took a decent amount of time. 
The holes I drilled are used to place locating pins into, so that after some wood glue is applied, I could place the fretboard on the neck until the pins find their holes. Then used a curved scrap board and clamps to squish it all together until the glue dried. Now the fretboard can be trimmed and cut to final size to match the neck before moving on to one of my favorite parts of the build, which was shaping the neck. It's a multi-step process to go from a square block of wood to the nice flowing round feel of a guitar neck. The first being to resaw out a lot of bulk waste over at the bandsaw. <laughs> okay, is this um, yeah. what it looks like? Yeah, it's what it looks like. Down and out? Straight between the two. Ooh, I like this. The second being to use a rasp to round over the back of the neck. I've never used one of these rasps, but it was easy enough to pick up right away. Before coming back to the shop to start shaping, Cremona and I drew some guidelines on the neck so that we can knock the edges down to create a nice but even bevel the entire length of the neck. Then I flipped it over and repeated. Oh yeah, looks good. So does yours, bud. Mm. Why are you going so slow? Oh, you already got the other side done. <laughs> <laughs> The rasp makes quick work of removing the wood, but the reason I think I liked it so much is the drastic effect it had on the feel. Ooh, there you go. That's pleasant. Oh that's yeah. Better, I guess. Wow, that's incredible. After getting both of these bevels, we drew on more guidelines, then knocked down more wood to give the neck its final shape. While here, we also shape the headstock of the guitar. By the way, can we just gawk for a moment at all that flame in the sycamore? Woo, that's pretty. Now this shape wasn't as easy to get as the neck. It is much more windy and free flowing, but again, Chris was nearby and made me feel confident that I wasn't messing it up. After getting the shape cut in, it was a bunch of hand sanding to remove all the big scratches, then go on to headstock. First was to attach a template for the style of guitar I wanted and drilled in the tuning holes, then used a bandsaw to remove the bulk of waste before refining it. Now, this is another cool trick I took away from the week, using a spindle sander as a thickness planer. I just think this is so clever. They set up a fence, which is just a scrap piece of wood clamped to the deck, set it to the thickness the headstock needed to be, and it gave me that really nice curved bit going into the frets. Ooh, goodness, this is taking shape, guys. You know, I never really noticed how many different areas of the guitar were shaped differently, but once you shape them by hand, you'll notice. <laughs> Next thing to shape was our fretboards, taking them from a square flat piece of wood to a slightly rounded curved surface. This is done by using a piece of wood that has a cove cut into it and just going back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. <laughs> All right, now a nerve wracking step. Remember that truss rod I put in the neck earlier? Well, now was the part to drill an access hole to tighten or loosen it, which in turn straightens out the neck. Okay, gosh, what if I go through the neck? How deep am I going? Um, you'll feel it pop right into the, the truss rod. Just to be clear, I don't like this step. Yeah, no, no one does. I was terrified I was gonna mess up my beautiful neck, but the operation yeah. did go smoothly. Not a fan, not a fan. Not a fan, I hate it so much. <laughs> I don't wanna be doing this one. There we go. Sir? Oh, I'm doing this. Yeah, you are. I'm skipping this step. Everything's optional right here. Up next was inlays. Typically, some sort of marker is placed on the 12th fret because this is the octave change. Chris gave me some mother of pearl to first cover in tape and draw out the shape I wanted. Another new tool for me to use was an inlay jig. Chris gave me a very quick rundown and then I went to town. That's as exciting. Um, this is a pretty handy tool. The saw can turn on a dime and it actually eats through the material very quickly. The only tricky part is you need to keep the handle straight up and down. You can see as I'm using it, I keep pulling the handle back towards my body. And I, I suppose it's just like everything else, it takes practice to get it. Either way, I got both my bow ties cut out in no time. So the next step was to cut in the matching shape into my fretboard where they're gonna be inserted. I first traced around them using a scalpel 
and then used a rotary tool mounted on a base that controls the depth and cut as close to my markings as possible without going over. This hogged away the majority of material where I just had to come back to do the final bit with the chisel. Then I could glue the bow ties in. That's my first inlay and I like it. Now with sanding it down flush, there is a ton of sanding in guitar making, but having friends around to cut up with makes even sanding enjoyable. Hey, you want to race? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, are you ready to see this ebony under some finish? This isn't the final finish, but next we put on a coat of protective oil that Crimson makes. This gives the fret board a coat of protection from the super glue that we're gonna be applying the frets in with in the next step. Pretty smooth too. Sanding works. Okay, hold on to your patience because the next major step was fret work. And while I'm gonna speed through it, it was an entire day's worth of work. It is tedious, but honestly, I didn't mind it. The first thing was to use a handsaw to clear out each and every fret, which goes quick enough. Next was to enlarge the top of the fret slots with a triangular file. A few swipes a piece is all this takes. Now to cut each fret, just slightly long at this point, from a reel of fret material. To glue them in, a small amount of CA glue was placed on the underside of each fret and then firmly hammered into place. You can kind of see that I hit the top, then the bottom, and then the center, and the fret not only compresses into the slot, but also flattens out. Matt was joking with me about how aggressively I hammered these in, but it paid off. After going through and snipping off the bulk of overhanging material on both sides, I came back with a file. First with a file at 90 degrees to the neck, then once flush, again at a slight angle. Little decals like this are small, but in the end result, they actually make a really big difference. So right now the frets are round and we need to sand them flat, even though later on we're going to eventually round them back out. And I know luthiers have a good reason for this. I just I can't remember what it is. First, I placed the black Sharpie all over the tops, then got to sanding until all the Sharpie marks were gone. Notice I'm not taking big sweeping back and forth motions with the sanding block. Instead, I'm trying to keep the majority of the block on the neck to ensure it stays nice and flat. Next was to go through and use a crimson specialty tool to find any high frets. This tool spans three frets at a time and indicates rocks. When you find one that rocks, you need to sand it down more. However, apparently I didn't have a single high fret. This drastically cut down on the amount of sanding I had to do. And I got to tell Cremona, ha, because he had lots of sanding to get his levels. <laughs> Who's laughing now? But not away from sanding yet. Now was to tape off a small back portion of the frets and sand them down to be slightly lower than the front frets. And now to file the frets back to round. I recommend you go ahead and pull up a chair to rest your feet while you work because this does not go quick. <laughs> I went to each fret individually and placed this protected covering with a slot in it over each fret. Then used a hand file to get each side back to round. Matt got done before me and did a celebratory happy dance. And even though I wasn't done, I couldn't help but join in. Next was to still use the protective cover, but change out the file to sandpaper. Instead of leaving the ends at the same angle I filed in earlier with the block file, now was to come back with a small wrap file and round the corners. So four per fret to eliminate all of the sharp edges. There is so much detail work that goes into making this one portion of the guitar not only sound and function great, but also be a comfort for your fingers and a pretty sight for your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now, unless I'm misremembering, that is it for the shaping. Next was to clean up the fretboard and get rid of all of the smeared CA glue or scratches or anything else. This was done with a razor blade, which I had never seen before, but it worked very well. Mm. This is sanding step 14. <laughs> After the obvious stuff was scraped, then I came back with sandpaper rolled over a finger, then ran through the grit. And if you think this sounds funny, it feels five times funnier. With that, we are getting closer to the end of fret work, guys. 
Next was to apply a coat of finish to clean off the fretboard, then tape off the wood so that the net could be taken over to a grinder wheel and all the frets could be buffed and polished. Now don't get me wrong, even though it's a tremendous amount of tedious steps to get these frets tip top, I was having a wonderful time. You'll notice in a lot of clips, I'm smiling or laughing. So don't let the heavy detail work sway you from this. Bow ties. It makes taking off that tape to reveal such beautifully shaped and shiny frets even more rewarding since I know I put in every single detail to get it there. On to one of the last additions to the neck, the fret markers on the top side of the neck. I drilled a small hole at the center of each fret, slightly beveled the tip of a white synthetic material, dabbed the end in CA glue, and then inserted it in. After all were placed, each one was cut as close to flush as possible and then filed down to be perfectly flush. Oh, and that is it. Other than the final sanding, of course. Ben taught me how to use a card scraper. Then Cremona and I spent the last remaining bit of the day getting out any and all scratches in the neck until they were flawless. This is an incredible experience on so many levels. I learned so much during this build. I mean, during the neck building portion alone, I learned a pocket full of tricks that I'll always carry. If you enjoyed this, stay tuned for my next video, which covers the body making portion of the guitar. I also highly encourage you to check out Triton Tools channel, where they've covered day by day, which is five days total. Big thank you to Triton and Crimson for this experience. So links to everything is down in the description, and I will see you on the next one. Real quick before you go, I wanna thank this video sponsor, which is ExpressVPN. I make a living by putting information on the internet and digital security is super important to me. I use ExpressVPN as a layer of protection for my personal information while on the internet. Without it, I am putting all of my digital security and business info in danger because hackers can steal my personal information, especially when I'm on a public Wi-Fi, like at airports or hotels when I travel. In the US, your internet service provider can also sell your data to advertisers without your consent. However, ExpressVPN makes sure that not even they can track my info and sell it for profit. It is also super convenient when I travel to other countries because social media platforms that I use for work may be banned in that country. ExpressVPN will allow me to access the content that I want without restrictions no matter what country I'm in. This really is so easy to use, and I can't recommend protecting your digital information enough. Take control of your internet privacy today and get three months free with the year package. That is less than $7 a month, and they have a 30-day money-back guarantee. You can visit expressvpn.com slash April or click the link down in the description for more information. Thank you so much to ExpressVPN for not only protecting my information, but also supporting this channel and what I do.